Sit down and grab your lunch. It's time for the Bolts Brown Bag, the only show where you make the call. Well, that one-week win reprieve in Jacksonville was nice, but uh, get back to reality this week as the Chargers fall to the Denver Broncos 17-3 and stretch their home streak without a touchdown to 10 straight quarters at Qualcomm Stadium. Welcome to Bolts Brown Bag live at 10news.com along with John Gennaro for the Mighty 1090 and Bolts from the Blue.com. I'm Ben Higgins back together again after what had to be the most anticipated dismal home game for the Chargers this season. I mean, at least against the Chiefs, there was a thought that the Chargers could win that game. It, right. it turned out worse. Right. But there was really not much even hope for this game against the Denver Broncos. The hope was that Brock Osweiler would be so bad that he would lose the game for the Broncos. And I guess when Eric Weddle dropped that interception, if he had caught it and run it back and made it a one-score game, that possibility existed throughout the game. It was never technically a blowout, but... The Chargers offense just had no hope whatsoever putting up any points at all against the Broncos defense, and unfortunately you need points to win a football game. You bring up a good point because it was never technically a blowout, and when Jason Verrett intercepted that pass in the end zone to keep it 17-3, to what was that, late in the third quarter, early in the fourth quarter, yeah. I thought, well, technically I guess this game isn't over, but you never really had the feeling that the Chargers had a chance to go down and score points and get back into it. You just, even as a fan, you didn't really have the, the usual hope you do that we've seen so many times of the Chargers scoring late and turning, you know, not close games into close games. I, I just never had that feeling yesterday. Yeah, I really wanted to turn the game off and walk away. I, there were a few times where uh, me and I'm sure a bunch of the writers that were sitting in the press box there, I wanted to write my story. I wanted to be done with it with five, six minutes left in the game, similar to the Chiefs game. I wanted to have everything written, and all I got to do is fill in the final score. But we had no idea what was going to happen because Philip Rivers has trained us to always believe that he can make a run at the end here. When people are looking at the score, seeing 17 to three, and wow, you know, it's not the the Chargers defense didn't play bad, and they didn't play bad. The Broncos offense, I think, has some struggles, but the Chargers defense played well enough to keep them in this game. Unfortunately, when you're three and nine, little successes like that just don't matter. So the question now for me is, have we seen our last great moment for the Chargers at Qualcomm Stadium? There's only one home game remaining in two weeks against the Miami Dolphins. What, I, was, what was the last great moment? I, I don't know. I, that's what I, I've got to remember. I mean, they at least had a couple of wins. The comeback against Detroit, to, you know, opening Probably day was, was pretty cool. I mean, yeah. you still had hope for the season at that point. They were sure. 1-0. It was very exciting, and, and that's kind of along the same lines I've gone with the poll question. I simplified it a little bit, and you can uh, log on to – well, you're probably already logged on. If you're watching right now, just scroll down. You can vote in our poll question, which is simply this. Will the Chargers win another game this season? They've got four more chances. They're going to be underdogs in all of them. Maybe the home game against Miami will be a close point spread. So if you don't think they're going to win that one – I can't see a predicting going into Kansas City, going into Oakland, or going into Denver and coming away with a victory at this point. Well, at this point, the Chargers, their, their best hope is 7-9, and nine, and they're not going to win that game against the Chiefs. They're probably not winning that game against the Raiders, and they're definitely not winning that game against the Broncos. So now your best hope is 4-12? and 12? If, if you can beat the Dolphins in that last game, at which point you're doing nothing but hurting the team, hurting the future of the team, hurting your draft pick spot. There's no reason to win any of these games. You have no chance of making the playoffs. You have no chance of even getting to 500. There's no reason for them to try and win these games. Phillip Rivers, Antonio Gates, Malcolm Floyd, these guys should be on the bench, if not IR'd, to keep them away from the team so that, one, they don't get hurt, and two, I mean, just because we respect Gates and Floyd and because Rivers is signed for another few years, and two, because you don't want to win these games. Winning these games would be bad for the Chargers. And honestly, I, I don't even think, not just for that reason, Charger fans aren't rooting for this team anymore. Well, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it seems like they're going to L.A. Everyone's mad at the ownership. They're mad at the coach. They're mad at the GM who got an extension that got revealed right before this game. There's no reason to root for this team right now. It was stunningly orange at Qualcomm Stadium yep. yesterday. I, I mean, we've seen large pockets of opposing fans. We've seen opposing colors. We've seen that for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Raiders visit, we see a lot of silver and black. The Packers are in town. It's all cheeseheads and green. The Steelers are in town. I've never seen the orange or any other color so 
just spread across the entire stadium where it really did look like you were in a different team's city at a different team's home stadium. Someone came to you right now and said, Ben, I have tickets to that Dolphins game, or I've been offered tickets to that Dolphins game. Should I go? Outside of, hey, you can tell your friends that you probably attended the last football game ever at Qualcomm Stadium, or at least NFL game at Qualcomm Stadium, there's no reason to go. I don't blame... The tailgate party better be good. At the this the point. tailgate party I better mean. be great, and there better be one <laughs> after the game, too. There's no reason for the Charger fans to not sell their tickets to Broncos fans right now. So that didn't surprise me. I expected that. All right, uh, the choices for the poll question are pretty simple. Yes, you think they will win at least one more game. Okay. No, you don't think they will win any more games and finish 3-13. and 13. Or I don't understand the question, <laughs> which has got 14% of the vote right now. Good job. 57% say yes, they'll win at least one more game. 29% think it's O for the rest of the season. If you want to comment on Bolts Brown Bag, uh, you can do so on Twitter. Use the hashtag Bolts Brown Bag. We read questions and comments throughout the show. We're going to talk about that Telesco news okay. in a moment, by Good. the way. First, I want to get to a couple of tweets, though. Scott Copperman at SHC1970 tweets in, the Bolts must sign the best street-wide receiver available through the end of 2015 to keep 17 alive. He has no one to pass to. Well, with Dontrell Inman going down yesterday, and I don't know, where happened to Stevie Johnson? Have it, we heard he anything was, yet? He, he was a ghost. I, I know he, uh, I believe he left the game late in the fourth quarter, but zero targets before he that. He had somewhere to get to? Yeah, it's, he, <laughs> he just wasn't, wasn't interested in catching passes. Or, you know, the Broncos just locked him down. I mean, the Broncos have the best defense in the league, probably the best secondary in the league, too. And they have the best collect, the top three corners on their team are better than three corners on any other team. So it wouldn't surprise me if Stevie Johnson got, you know, shut down by one of them. Malcolm Floyd didn't do much of anything either. Really, the entire passing game was centered around Antonio Gates and occasionally passes to Danny Woodhead. I don't know if it's a receiver that's going to keep Phillip alive. No. It would probably be offensive linemen, and they were and completely overmatched by the Broncos' defensive line, Vaughn Miller, the pass rushers. I mean, it was a bloodbath on the front seven trying to protect Phillip Rivers yesterday. And they're going to be overwhelmed by the Kansas City Chiefs this week as well. The only person who can save Phillip Rivers to keep him from getting injured, maybe seriously injured, in the last four games of the season is Mike McCoy or possibly Tom Telesco putting him on the bench and saying, you're a backup. Or putting him on IR and saying, Brad Sorensen's the backup, Kellen Clements is the starter. Something bad is going to happen if Rivers plays the rest of the snaps of this season. I'm convinced of it. All right, uh, Matthew tweets in, uh, now that Tom Telesco and possibly Mike McCoy are staying, which tight end or safety are we trading up for in the first round? All right, let me give some context to that. If you missed it yesterday, uh, NFL insider Jason Lockenfora tweeted before the game what came as pretty shocking news to those of us who follow the team and cover it on a regular basis, mm -hmm. that not only had the Chargers given Tom Telesco a three-year contract extension, but they had done so before the season even started, like way back in August, and then just declined to tell anybody about it moving forward. Incl including the players. The players didn't know either. Yeah, on the guys that they didn't want it to be a distraction going into the season, which to me is just the silliest reason you can come up with because normally – you announce these things to prevent them from becoming a distraction. The uncertainty, especially for players, is what creates distraction, that you don't know who's going to be your boss, you don't know who you're going to be negotiating with. Put it That's this the way. uncertainty. Put it this way. Marty Caswell from the Mighty 1090, who spends a lot of time down at Chargers Park in the Chargers locker room. She's been to every road game this year and every home game. She's in the locker room. She has great relationships with the Chargers players. She said the players up to this point in the season had been asking her, what are you hearing about McCoy? What are you hearing about Telesco? Are these guys going to be around next year? Number one, that shows they didn't know. Number two, it shows that it's a distraction. If they're asking someone who's not even in the building, not a part of the Chargers organization, what she knows about what's going on with Tom Telesco, they're already distracted. So it begs the question, if Tom Telesco got a secret contract extension, uh, is there any chance that Mike McCoy got one as well and no one told us, so he had to be asked about it after the game yesterday? Well, I'm, I'm happy for Tom. I, I'm happy for Tom. He deserves it. He's worked hard. He does a good job. Um, and I'm happy for him. Where were you offered one as well? I'm happy for Tom. I, I was not offered, but I was not offered a contract, no.
pulling teeth, but yes, he did finally admit he that did. no, he, he does not have a contract extension from the Chargers and uh, will go into the last season of his contract if he is not fired at the end of the year, which I continue to maintain is the only logical course of action for the Chargers. But there was another report out yesterday that seems to be floating around, possibly leaked by the Chargers front office, that they're considering keeping Mike McCoy and just making him get rid of a bunch of his assistant coaches and coordinators and, and putting new staff around him. If Mike McCoy is the San Diego Chargers head coach next year, it is a clear sign that the Spanos family, Tom Telesco, everyone running this organization is perfectly happy with failure, perfectly happy with garbage. If, if he is still the head coach, I don't care if you're getting rid of all of his coaches, and I don't care if Tom Telesco then gets to pick who the new coaching staff is. If Mike McCoy is here after a what will probably be 4-12 and or 3-13 and season for the San Diego Chargers after a poor season last year, and the only good season he had, the team backed into the playoffs with the help of Ken Wisenhunt, you're saying we are perfectly satisfied by failure and that'll go all the way down that'll go to the players that'll go to the fans and everyone will understand that the Chargers are not in this game to win all right Armin chimes in after hearing the news of McCoy possibly staying but with a new staff who would you choose as the new offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator I I'm not sure that the names are out there right now you can't just steal someone else's offensive or defensive coordinator unless you're going to make them a head coach. That's, exactly. That's how it works in the NFL. Right. So Pe People were throwing out the names like Wade Phillips, Hugh Jackson. The fact of the matter is these guys are already coordinators, and they're coordinators for good teams, championship contenders. There's absolutely no reason for them to accept a job somewhere else unless it's a promotion. And if you're not opening up Mike McCoy's spot, then there is no promotion. So what I think is because Ken Wisenhunt helped Mike McCoy so much that first year, they're going to have to get another guy who was fired from a head coaching job, not good enough to get immediately another head coaching job, and who's going to want to coach for a year or two, essentially acting as assistant head coach, guiding Mike McCoy along to you know, rebuild his own credibility. And Raymond suggests Ken Wisenhunt. Who, yes, <laughs> who got fired in the middle of the season, and he's an option. And you know, Mike McCoy may say, hey, I work well with him. And Philip Rivers may say, hey, I loved Wiz. Bring him back. It's a possibility. However, look at this from Mike McCoy's standpoint. And maybe he's not the one making this call. But look at this from Mike McCoy's standpoint. If he has a good team under Ken Wisenhunt, a bad team without him, and a good team under Ken Wisenhunt, that doesn't make Mike no. McCoy look good. No, you're right. I, I think the only possible good sign of Mike McCoy returning is that it means the Chargers are still in San Diego and didn't want to <laughs> hire a fresh new head coach it's totally with true. still uncertainty about Los Angeles possibly hanging over their heads for another year. I can't see them moving to L.A. with Mike McCoy in tow. I mean, I, you think – I mean, San Diego is easy compared to Los Angeles with what he's going to have to deal with up there, the way he handles the media. I, I just cannot possibly see Mike McCoy as the head of an NFL franchise in Los Angeles – you know, making a good first impression on a very fickle sports community up there for a team that probably doesn't have a great base to begin with and is probably competing against another team, the Rams or the Raiders, who already has a much better built-in fan base. I agree with you, and I disagree with you at the same time because Mike McCoy being the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers next year makes no sense whatsoever, literally zero sense. A reasonable, responsible individual team person in charge of that make sure that doesn't happen the chargers are not reasonable they're not intelligent they're not smart they do stupid things all the time if you were to say would the chargers take mike mccoy as their head coach to los angeles next year i'd say that is incredibly stupid and something the chargers would totally do. all right let's move on to a different topic because melvin gordon uh, was running the ball okay yesterday yeah but then had the fumble early in the third quarter as the Chargers were driving around midfield. And then had another one that went out of bounds. The yep. Chargers didn't lose. You might have not even noticed it later. But after that, he did not return to the game. Mike McCoy was asked about his rookie running back and the fumbles after the game. You can't put the ball on the ground. You, you, you can't, you know, you're not going to play if you put the ball on the ground. It sucks. You know, you start getting in the rhythm. You start getting in the groove. And then, you know, you have a bad play and it kind of just, just kills everything, you know. Kill the whole vibe, kill the momentum. 
feel like we had we were starting to get the momentum on that drive and uh, you know the fumble just kind of takes that way and put that back in the, the momentum back in Denver hands. Okay, I like that Melvin Gordon at least has the self-awareness to know the problem with fumbling because and, he's absolutely right with what he said. And can I say something? I, I know there's a lot of people today that are destroying Mike McCoy because he took Melvin Gordon out of this game. I think where he really screwed up was with his answer in that press conference. He said, you're not going to get in the game if you fumble the ball. I'm going to give you a better answer. I'm going to pretend I'm Mike McCoy for a second, all right? You asked me the question, you know, why was he taken out of the game? Thought he was having a real good game, probably his best game of the season. Didn't want the kid to lose confidence with, you know, a, a bunch of bad things. Wanted him to leave this game with it still being overall a good one for him. Nice answer. Thank you. You want to be the next coach of the I Chargers? I would love to be the next coach of the Chargers. <laughs> um, if you're competing for a playoff spot, you certainly have to consider sitting down a guy who's fumble prone at that point in the season. He might cost you a game yes. at an inopportune moment. Eric Williams from ESPN.com made a great point. He said, Phillip Rivers has thrown five pick sixes this season. No one's saying that he needs to be sat down or benched right. or, you know, right. because he's turning the ball over and costing his team. Why are you doing it with Melvin Gordon, especially at this point in a season, that the only thing you can get out of these last four or five games, now four, is developing your young players like Melvin Gordon, giving them experience, giving them touches, and having them learn from their mistakes while they're on the field. When you take him off the field, you don't do that anymore. Well, and here's where I think – Tom Telesco may have already made up his mind about Mike McCoy. I'm not sure that I believe those rumors that are out there. And I think Tom Telesco and the Chargers are keeping Mike McCoy on purpose as a way of tanking because they know Mike McCoy has to play every game, coach every single game as if he's trying to win. And that doesn't help this team. That doesn't help Melvin Gordon become a better player. And they're more concerned right now with, okay, we'll worry about this in the offseason. But when Mike McCoy is trying to – I mean, having a 3-13 and 13 season on your coaching resume is a stain. Whenever Norv Turner gets hired anywhere, people pull out his overall coaching record. Same thing with Jeff Fisher. Same thing with all coaches that have coached for a while. Mike McCoy doesn't want the stain of this losing season – on his resume, so he's trying to win games, and that is hurting the team. And I think if it's not on purpose, then we should really shake our heads at the Chargers and say, how stupid are you? That being said, I would be shocked if Melvin Gordon didn't get another good handful of touches in Kansas City. Sure. Uh, he should be, first of all. Second of all, you can't just let Phillip Rivers drop back every pass and get killed by the Kansas City defense. That would be exceedingly stupid. I also think if this was a game where the Chargers were down by 20 or 30, Melvin Gordon probably gets back in there. Down by two scores, like we said, game was still there. Phillip Rivers could have thrown a touchdown. They could have gotten an onside kick, even with a minute and a half left, and Phillip Rivers could have driven them down again. We've seen him do it before. We saw him do it against the Detroit Lions. I think Mike McCoy still had hopes of an 8-8 eight eight season he still had hopes of beating the, the Denver Broncos, his former employer, our division rival. He still had hopes that he was going to turn this season around in the second half of this game. Now, the biggest effect of Melvin Gordon coming out of the game is that it nearly led to Donald Brown winning our Bolts Brown Bagger of the Game Award. He was which, good. Which would have been like the, the biggest shock of the season, yeah. probably. But out of nowhere. I had to focus on the defense because, okay. I, you know, the defense gave up, as Philip Rivers said, almost depressingly after the game. They only gave up 10 points. I yeah. mean, we got to be able to win yeah. when our defense only gives up 10 points, and yeah. they did. So I had to pick the defense. Jason Verrett had the interception. Denzel Perriman had another 10 tackles, another good game. But today's Bolts Brown Bagger of the Game Award goes to, hey, E-Dub. Eric Weddle. Eric Weddle. Three passes defended. I was flying around, looking a little healthier out there to me, and I thought had one of his better games of the season. I think it was his best game of the season. There you go. I don't think it's much of a question. Okay. I, I think he looked like the old Eric Weddle for the first time in a long time. Yeah, I think uh, it's probably groin finally getting, getting healthy again. And this is critical, by the way. These last couple of weeks are critical for Eric Weddle to show that he is healthy because he's going into a free agent market. He doesn't want to have, you know, an injury – questions about his performance hanging over his head. He and wants a bidding war for Eric Weddle in the offseason. And that's key, because I think he's 31 years old, so people are going to start wondering, you know, how long of a contract do we want to give him? Maybe he's on the tail end of his, his, you know, 
peak. Maybe this is the time when he's starting to decline as a player. And that's really, you can make that case with what we've seen so far this season. I think these last four or five games, you're going to see the old Eric Weddle, and then people are going to say, oh, he was just you know bogged down by Mike McCoy. Maybe he was injured, but he's still that guy that you want to pay top dollar to. All right, uh, much more exciting than the conclusion of the Chargers season will be the conclusion of our NFL Picks Contest because it is tight coming down to the final four weeks of the season. Oh. John, I was able to come back and tie you again, 42-42. to 42. I was able to get three points. You had only the one point. How well, did I lose that Texans uh, game? They well, you know what? All three of us had either were tied or the lead for our upset picks uh. in the fourth quarter. Uh, Chris got his two-point so we pick of the we Seahawks. We were all so. almost right. Yeah, uh, so it's still anyone's ball game with, with four weeks left to go in the season. Uh, the Chiefs have been hot. Uh, we'll see. I, I've, I've seen early numbers around 10, 10 and a half for the Chiefs and the Chargers for next week. So it's a lot, but doesn't seem like that's enough. a that's a lot for a division game. Thirty three to three. Two but weeks yeah, but ago. they won. They won by 30 points and they are clicking on all cylinders. And if this game against the Broncos showed us anything in the game against the Chiefs a couple weeks ago, it's that you can stop this offense, and the Chiefs can put up more than, what, 14, 20 points probably? I mean, the offense isn't great, but it, it, they can certainly put up 20 points a game. Uh, as long as the Chargers' defense doesn't show up and, and play amazingly, I think the Chargers do lose by 10 or more points. What can't be stopped, no matter what defensive scheme we try, 3-4, four, 4-3, four, nickel package, are Ferris's questions, and it is time... <laughs> For Ferris Tanyos to give us his three NFL questions. Hey, you're very, el you're el very elusive as a question answer. <laughs> Tough to bring down in this segment. Yep. I, I try. Yeah. Um, so first question, uh, there were nine missed uh, PATs yesterday. Wow. More than all of last season combined. Nine. Nine. Yeah. So obviously we can agree that it's added excitement to the game, moving the ball back. Uh, so my question is this, uh, should the NFL go a step further next year, scrap PATs entirely, and just have two-point conversion? This one's an easy one for me. No. No. No, because I think what they've done this year, first of all, has been pretty successful. He but just said it made it more exciting than ever. What's yes, the problem? But here's what you really like, <laughs> is that by giving coaches a choice, you give coaches a chance to make the wrong choice, which yep. is always the most entertaining thing that can happen <laughs> yeah. in an NFL game is for a coach to make the absolute dumbest strategic decision possible, and that allows us to all have fun on Twitter and Facebook. Not to mention, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that go into this. Number one, kickers, and I know this is stupid, but kickers get points every time they, they kick extra points. So now you're going to put all those points records completely out of control. No one's ever going to catch them ever again if you get rid of extra points. And now and then you would make the kicker position almost meaningless. You would have field goals, but you know, you're that's four or five very very important point scoring plays per game. They're just going, "No, nah, we don't need the kickers. We're going to bring the players back out." So I, I think it changes the game too much. I like where they're at right now. I think uh, I think it's been a shockingly successful rule change this year. I, I was not Do shocked. I, I thought it was going to be great. Are there any coaches? Mike Tomlin's gotten close to this. Are there any coaches you think that will ever come out and say, "You know what? This season." Just two-point conversions. Maybe. No. I, I just think there's always a spot where you're going to have to s go for one. I, I, mean, I, I think you'll have coaches. I mean, Mike Tomlin goes for it a lot. I think you'll have coaches that go for it more often than not. But let's put it this way. If a team is up by 25 points in the fourth quarter and they score a touchdown, what point is there to go for two? You're already up by 31 points. Just take the easier play and move on. Yeah. All right, uh, question number two. All right, so question two. Uh, Chip Kelly, as you know, brought brought DeMarco Murray to Philly for uh, for a lot of money, $21 million guaranteed. Uh, yesterday, uh, DeMarco played a grand total of 14 snaps. Uh, they, he also brought, uh, Kelly also brought Ryan Matthews uh, in as well. Ryan Matthews was concussed in a play yesterday. Uh, so, is Kelly, um, they, oh, they, they beat the Patriots anyway, but is Kelly a psychopath, a genius, or a bit of both? What is he? Can I just talk about the NFC East for a second <laughs> Go for without it. answering that question? Go for it. I, I'm very excited about tonight's Monday Night Football game. Yeah? Because if Dallas beats Washington, you're going to have a three-way tie for first place at, at five and seven. seven. I know. And I went and I looked ahead at the Giants, the Eagles, and the Redskins schedules the next two weeks. I think they all and play each other. No, they don't. Okay. They don't play the next two weeks. In fact, they all play games that are eminently losable 
two in a row. Really? So you could you could without too oh, much. Oh, you weren't you weren't looking at the Cowboys, were you? The Cowboys uh, don't after this week they play they play a couple of tough games as well. They played the Jets and they play someone Carolina, I think. Oh man. So they could be they're going to lose probably at least one of those. But you could have a situation where after week 15 you've got three or possibly four five and nine teams <laughs> tied for first place tied for first place in the division and so you you would then have an outside chance of a five and 11 team making the playoffs well then they play all each other so oh, okay. I don't think that's possible because the last two weeks are, are all usually all divisional so now. a seven and nine so, team makes the playoffs. or if they all split which would be the best yeah you have a four-way six and ten tie at the end of the year and have to go to some sort of crazy tiebreaker. I'm now rooting exactly, exactly. for that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Chip Kelly, I don't think he's either. I think he's just wrong. Look, here, <laughs> here's, here's what I hate about this question. When there's a player on the Chargers, like a Brandon Flowers or a Donald Butler, we're sitting here criticizing, saying, the only reason he's on the field is because he makes a ton of money. Now, Chip Kelly has the balls to go, I don't care how much money DeMar DeMarco Murray is paid. I don't care how far we went out of our way to get him this year. He's not performing so he doesn't play. That's the way coaches should coach. That doesn't make him a psychopath. That makes him smart. You know, uh, Pete Carroll did the same thing when they went out and paid Matt Flynn a ton of money to be their quarterback. And then and, cut him. And then decided, you know what? Russell Wilson, this third round draft pick is better, so we're just going to play him instead. And you know what? I'm going to look stupid because I'm the one who brought this guy in, but <laughs> I'm not going to double down on my mistake by playing the wrong guy uh, just because it's going to make me look not stupid for signing the wrong guy. And how to work out for him. And how to work out for the Chargers the last couple weeks saying, look, Donald Butler, you make a ton of money. Go sit on the bench. The defense has been improved vastly. Yep. By, by Denzel Perriman being in there instead. All right, question number right. three. Uh, this one's simple. Who are your offensive and defensive rookie of the years? Ooh. Offensive Todd and Gurley defense. has been, I mean, he had a terrible game yesterday. Do you want me to throw and out some names? Sure, yeah, throw sure. out some names. Okay. I, you mentioned Gurley, uh, Thomas Rawls, uh, TJ Yeldon, Jameis Winston, Amari Cooper. Oh, Jameis, Jameis Winston. Winston. Jameis Winston for the me. The way he's played lately. For sure. I, I think Gurley or Winston. I mean, Mariota hasn't been terrible either. Did you see that 87-yard touchdown run? Kid can run. Wow, that was he's, that was pretty cool. He's yeah. a hell of a player. He just needs the right coach to be with him, and apparently Ken Wisenhut wasn't the guy. The, the only reason I'm checking the list of the guys drafted is Who's I, the cornerback who's playing really well? What's his name? Uh, uh, did, 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 you talk about Marcus Peters Yeah, for the Chiefs? Yeah. Marcus yeah. Peters, he's, is he's excellent. He's a nickel corner, though. I was hoping for someone who's more of a – a starter. Danny Shelton has been okay. Another guy is Demarius Randall for the Packers. Yeah, there's not a lot of there's no not one's a, standing out on the defensive not a lot side of the ball. To pick from here for the from the defensive side of the ball, it might end up being Marcus Peters, but um, give it to Denzel Perriman wait, and just walk away. Another <laughs> name to throw out there, and I, I think I think I would pick James Winston, but someone that I would give strong consideration to, maybe even some sort of vote to, is Lyle Collins who went undrafted even though he was supposed to be a first-round draft pick because there was some issue. with yeah. he, he wasn't arrested, but he was being questioned and a murder and all of that. Took over the starting job as the left guard for the Cowboys in week three or four and might end up in the Pro Bowl. He's been such a good guard for them. He missed the kick yesterday, but can I give Josh Lambeau the special teams rookie of the Go year award? It. Is there such a thing? I don't think I don't so, think but is. sure. <laughs> all right, Ferris, thank you very much. Thank you. Three questions with Ferris Tanyos. Uh, got a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to bring up, I was talking about this with uh, Luke Smith, uh, our, our web head here uh, a couple days ago. He said, bring this up on Bolts Brown Bag. You know how they've had the discussion about going to 18 games, but there's been a lot of pushback from the players' union. Yes. I, I still like the general idea of taking away preseason games and adding regular season games. But sure. But I also am concerned for the safety of the players. So my idea, and I don't know that I've seen this anywhere else floated, and maybe you've heard of it before, is going to an 18-game season. Yep. But having a 16-game cap on each individual player. Ooh. And then it's up to the team and the coaching staff to decide which two games they sit out. And I think it just adds such a great element of strategy for a team, especially with a, a great quarterback. Do you sit him against a bad team? Do you wait and see if he gets hurt? What if you keep playing him and then you get near the end of the season and he's still got his two games that he's got to sit down? I love Plus it gets more players into the game. You get to see some of these backup quarterbacks that don't do anything. I love that idea. Here's why that doesn't happen. Two reasons. Okay. Number one. They make the TV schedule before the season. And God forbid Bill Belichick should 
play someone besides Tom Brady in front of a national audience, the NFL will lose its mind the same way the NBA did when Greg Popovich but it, I mean, would, would that bench be perfect, all of his though, starters. The, the social discussion that would lead – when they announced 90 minutes before the game, this is a Brady sit-out game. I mean, everyone would go crazy. Yes. And they'd have to see what happens with no Tom Brady on the field. The other side is they would have to expand rosters because the way it is yeah. now, most teams only have two quarterbacks. Yeah. If you can't play Brady and the backup gets hurt, what do you do then? Yeah. So I always thought the way it should be handled. Obviously, I don't think you're getting to 18 games. I think it should be 17 games with, you know, that final game being neutral site affairs. We talked about that, too. I like that. That wasn't my idea. I've seen that elsewhere, but I like that idea we a did. lot. We did, and you can, you can take away one preseason game, add one regular season game. But really, and this is the part of the conversation people don't talk about, there are way too many restrictions on practice right now, especially in training camp, how long they can practice, how often they can practice, how often they can wear pads. I think if Supposedly you, for the health of the players. Yes. And it but seemed to have had the opposite effect. It, absolutely, because they're less prepared for the beating that comes once the season begins, or even in the preseason games. So I think what you do is you take away a preseason game, you add a game at the end, you loosen some of those restrictions on practices, you figure out the neutral site, and that's going to be a situation that the players' union is going to be okay with because it's a negotiation. At the end of the day, it's not the players' union wants this, the NFL wants this, they're never going to agree. They're going to find a happy meeting. And the NFL gets to expand to more international cities, Mexico City, Germany. They can put games there. If everyone's playing one neutral site game, you've got plenty of available venues. You can have your three or four London games, throw a game in Vegas, in San Antonio. You can put them anywhere. I yeah. mean, so, some of these countries around the world have giant stadiums for the sake of soccer events. You could play games in China. You could play games in Brazil. You could play games in Qatar. Anywhere that the NFL wanted to branch out a little bit internationally, the option would be there. All right, uh, Chargers and Chiefs next week. Chiefs have won six in a row and seem well on their way to an AFC wild card spot. Probably the second best defense in the league behind yeah. the Denver Broncos. Um, any, any thoughts on what the Chargers could do to win this one? No. Okay. <laughs> I, that's, that, that's our preview for yeah, next I, week. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> see it. I really don't. I, I guess – if you can somehow, I mean, the defense has been playing well. We know Alex Smith is limited as a quarterback, although he's been throwing deeper passes now because Jeremy Macklin's getting open deep down the field. But if you can shut down Travis Kelsey, you can shut down Alex Smith, you're probably not going to force any turnovers, but you can keep them kicking field goals instead of scoring touchdowns, and then the offense just has to somehow, some way, find a way to get the running game going, balance itself out, which creates – Big plays down the field. Eric Will needs to make a, at least one interception for old times' sake. Sure, and, he, and he's got to he's got to do the mic he's drop. Remember, too. he uh, he intercepted. Uh, was it was it Castle or yep. was it Smith to to cinch one of those games against Kansas City? Yeah, that was that ago. was when he did the mic drop with yeah. the ball at the end. I think that was Smith, but I could be I wrong. I can't remember. All right, so uh, next week we will be back. Uh, hopefully, the Chargers. Don't look as boring as they did yesterday. Even if they lose, which they're going to, I, I, get on yeah, the board. Scoring fast, a little bit Do of something. A li you know what? It makes for exciting football. Passes to wide receivers. Just throw some passes to the wide right. receivers. That's that's the prescription for fun for yes. next week in Kansas City. We'll be back next week at 12:30 on Monday for another edition of Bolts Brown Bag for John Gennaro. I'm Ben Higgins. Thanks for joining us on 10news.com.